it is this really broad and inclusive community. If you join like the longevity subreddit, for example, there's like a hundred thousand people that are always talking about this stuff. It, there's a, I mean, family isn't the right word to use, but it really feels like this collectivist sort of like uh, very inclusive and welcoming community. And, and the blockchain space is the same. Hello, and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video, I had the great pleasure of speaking with Tyler Galato, co-founder and chief scientific officer at Molecule, a collaborative platform to accelerate the process of bringing novel therapeutics to patients, and who has more recently co-initiated FetaDAO, the world's first decentralised intellectual property collective, funding research into human longevity. Here we discuss both these projects and how they will aid the future of longevity research. So hi Tyler, thank you for joining me today and welcome to the, the Shiki Science Show. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, so my first question for you, before we talk about all of the amazing work you're doing with Fita Dow, I wanted to ask you first, because you initially uh, studied biochemistry at university, as did I. So I'm very curious as to what was your interest into researching science? And then how did you make that kind of transition from researching biochemistry into exploring this world of blockchain technology? Yeah, so I mean, I started my career, well, not even my career, my, my interest developed at, at quite a young age. Um, my sister was born when I was five years old, and she had a, a sort of a respiratory virus for the first like year of her life, um, or some respiratory condition, and she spent a lot of time in, in the hospital. And so I think at a young age, I sort of had an imprinting experience in, in hospitals and with physicians that, um, yeah, in, in my immature young mind, like these were people that were helping my sister and that had a big effect on me. I thought I wanted to be a physician for, yeah, I would say up until I was in my, my early 20s. So initially exploring biochemistry was really just what I was viewing as like a, a pre-med sort of, sort of education course in the United States. Um, during that time, I also spent a lot of time in hospitals. So I was working as a nurse aide, for example, um, during my summers and, and also when I was in school, really spending a lot of time, um, not only just around doctors, but just trying to understand how the healthcare system works at a high level. And I think I had some early experiences, uh, particularly in the context of the US healthcare system, where I, I realized that there were yeah, a number of things that were sort of suboptimal in terms of how patients are treated, how care is accessed, you know, why some people are able to get care and, and why other people weren't. And I found this to be, to be somewhat frustrating. So increasingly, I think when I was actually at university, I, I started to really enjoy my, my biochemistry classes. I became really interested in, in genetics and I started to feel like I potentially would have a, a more fulfilling career being able to, let's say, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if this is the right way to put it, but making broader contributions if I really explored the, the sciences. So yeah, during that time, um, I went to like a, a small liberal arts school and university. They didn't have, let's say, they don't have a medical school. They didn't have really well-established laboratories. But during the time that I was there, um, research was becoming, I think, an increasingly important part of, of what the university was trying to position towards. And I had the opportunity quite early on to get involved with um, yeah, some interesting next-gen sequencing approaches. We were actually doing projects studying the um, microbiome of horseshoe crab eggs, which I can go into more or less depth if you're interested in hearing about that. Um, yeah, and through that, this was the first time, I think that year was the year that the university got next-gen sequencers. I was one of the first students to be able to use those. Um, and then that actually led me on sort of an interesting research path, first into cancer therapeutics, um, which was actually linked to the horseshoe crab project. Strangely, there was this bacteria that was affecting um, horseshoe crab egg populations that was cytotoxic and we realized could have some potential anti-cancer properties. I got deeper and deeper into sort of oncology and experimental therapeutics in the context of oncology with a focus on pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma and, and neuroendocrine tumors. And then through that um, also became interested in general in, in biogerontology and, and the, the science of aging, which I saw as this really interesting sort of new paradigm through which we could approach um, really medicine in a different way. We could take a more preventative approach, focus on really maintaining health as opposed to treating it and maybe make headway into treating all age-related diseases. Um, during this time, I was also really interested in 
sort of the, the macroeconomics of pharma and drug development, how drugs actually come to market, what the incentives are. Um, and I think, yeah, there was an article that came out maybe in 2017 that was penned by, um, it was a couple of people from Goldman Sachs and the article was titled, Is Curing Disease a Sustainable Business Model? And I found this really provocative and, and really speaking to what I saw as some of the core systemic problems that exist and the incentives that exist around drug development in the United States. And increasingly, I felt like I didn't necessarily, yeah, I was, I started to become quite interested in this problem. So this problem of like, there are some core, let's say problems with incentive structures and um, let's say innovation in the pharmaceutical development ecosystem. Uh, felt like that was a problem that I was really interested in trying to work on, but I, I wasn't really sure how. Um, and then I sometime later met um, my co-founder at Molecule, Paul Kolhas, who came from a sort of yeah, economics background, but particularly with a focus on, on blockchain and, and how decentralized systems were being beginning to be leveraged to create, let's say, new incentive structures to allow like collaboration or in some cases, decentralized governance. Um, yeah, and we founded a company, this is like maybe three and a half years ago now, that was really focused on trying to leverage these technologies, decentralized technologies and Web3 technologies to change in some incentive structures um, in, in drug development and to change, let's say, how, how the public actually interacts with intellectual property around therapeutics. Cool, thank you for that explanation. So in terms of um, the problems in drug development, what, what actually are the major problems that you are trying to solve? Uh, with Molecule? Yeah, the, there's a number. I mean, so over over the past 30 or so years, the way that drug development happens is, has really fundamentally changed. So the pharmaceutical drug development pipeline from sort of discovery to market used to be vertically integrated. It used to be that a pharmaceutical company did, you know, sort of drug discovery, um, preclinical development, in some cases, clinical trials, all the way through to market in-house. And over time, the ROI, so the, 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 the sort of, um, yeah, the, the profit of the, how profitable this process was really started declining. There's a number of theories about why this is, but in 2020, the, the ROI on internal R&D for pharmaceutical companies re reached about 0%, meaning that it just simply wasn't profitable to do um, in-house drug development. So what you had start to happen was this change in the, let's say, macroeconomic landscape where it was highly incentivized for pharmaceutical companies to really start outsourcing intellectual property from, from academia. So I think in the past five years, it was something like more than half of the top selling drugs that are that, that have been brought to market originated at universities where, you know, in, in maybe 20 years ago, it was it was maybe something like 10%. So there's been this really, really big shift in how drugs are being developed. And the problems relate to the cost of bringing a drug to market, which is, you know, depending on the estimate and who you speak to or, or what the sort of study metrics are anywhere from on the low end, $800 million to on the high end, $2.8 billion, according to a, I think like a landmark tough study that is, that is often referenced. Um, and that means that in order to develop a drug, there needs to be a, a really strong, let's say financial incentive. It's very difficult for a university or an academic or really most organizations on the planet to have access to the capital that is required to bring a drug to market. And what that means is that um, when a pharmaceutical company is looking at whether or not a drug should be developed, um, the metrics aren't really, you know, what is the impact on patients or is this something that is going to cure disease? They tend to be driven largely by whether or not the, the, the pharmaceutical company will be able to recoup the cost and potentially profit from the investment that it's made. The problem with that is that there are a lot of, let's say, rare diseases. There are a lot of therapies, antibiotics, for example, that don't really meet that sort of criteria from a, from a profitability standpoint, let's say. And, and therefore, the incentives to develop these um, are quite minimal. So a lot of what we've been doing with Molecule is trying to figure out how can we bring together communities, whether these be patient advocacy communities, whether they be communities of researchers, whether they be organizations, you know, philanthropic organizations, 
and unify them in such a way that they can fund the development of these therapeutics that maybe pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in. Um, and through that funding also have ownership in the intellectual property that results from, from these projects. And the idea is that by creating a situation where a patient or a group of patients or a patient advocacy groups actually become the governors and owners of intellectual property that the incentives to develop these things somewhat change. And the example that I often give when I, when I speak about this is, you know, what would it look like if insulin was collectively owned and governed by diabetics? How would it be priced? What would access to that look like? Um, how would a patient behave differently from a corporation, for example? So these are the sort of that's the high level engineering question. And then there's a number of, let's say, technical implementations, legal frameworks um, and design frameworks that you can create to try to encourage that behavior, to try to get people to fund these things and to do so with some sort of incentive. Well, thank you for elaborating on that. So, I mean, do you have any examples at the moment of why you've taken any drugs and helped to mediate this process? Yeah, so there's a couple, this is all, it, it took us roughly, I mean, Molecule has existed for three years. It probably took us two years of, of trial and error at, around many different components of, of what we were building to try to get to something um, that really made sense and that we could work with. We did some early, early trials actually with um, doing the decentralized funding of microdosing experiments with psilocybin for the treatment of anxiety and depression. Um, weren't able to raise a huge amount of money there, but managed to do a, do a little bit, still very fringy at the time, I think, in terms of like the technology that we're using. But the, the current implementation of, of a lot of our design thinking and the tools that Molecule ha has been building are, are really in the form of, of VitaDAO, which is a decentralized collective for funding longevity therapeutics um, using the same framework. So basically bringing together a large community of enthusiasts, researchers, anyone who's interested in the aging space. And I, I suppose this is a, you know, with aging, everyone is a patient, right? So, I mean, this is sort of the broadest, uh, I would say, implementation of this really possible. Um, and we have basically, VitaDAO is a, a live organization that is actively has raised around, uh, I believe, at current ether prices, $8 million, and is deploying that actively into, into research projects. And the first project that we have this happening with is a repurposing project at the University of Copenhagen with uh, Morten Shabait Knudsen, who has basically, he had exclusive access um, to the Danish health systems, uh, medical records, histological records, and prescription records, which I believe it's roughly 3.5 billion data points covering something like 3,500 prescriptions on about 5 million people over 40 years. So this really, really robust, um, really, really robust database. And they spent, um, I think, roughly two years looking at the data in this, in this database and trying to work out whether or not there were some number of previously approved therapeutics that had been um, implicated in extending health span and lifespan. So let's say these therapeutics were highly conserved, for example, among populations of centenarians and supercentenarians. And now they're basically working backwards from this data in humans to understand the novel, like if there's a, a let's say off target of action here in these therapeutics that's contributing to um, this pro longevity effect. And, and that's really the first project that we're working on. But we're currently evaluating, I think between 20 and 30 additional projects. And again, this, this beaded out experiment, if you could call it that really began about 12 weeks ago. So the hope is to really get this sort of yeah, flywheel spinning and, and a lot of projects funded under this framework in the next, in the next like six months. Wow, no, that's really exciting. And well, you beat me to my next question, which was about Feed to Dow. And so I guess before we go further into exploring what Feed to Dow is, I think it would definitely help probably myself and also my viewers if we just kind of explain, um, or if you can explain what you mean by blockchain and what is like decentralized technologies and what, what even is a Dow. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, these are something I often say that like speaking to someone about, about blockchain is like speaking about God. It's like everyone has a different conceptualization of what these things are. The media obviously plays a strong role as well in sort of like 
you know, there's some confusion between blockchain and cryptocurrency and and yeah but i think the easiest way to to think about a blockchain is simply a it's a decentralized database that is not controlled by any one individual there's a lot of redundancy in it and therefore it's immutable it's permissionless and it's trustless so basically the way a blockchain works is that it's a it's a ledger it's basically making a record of transactions that occur using this decentralized peer to peer network and every block that is created contains all of the previous transactions that have ever occurred um, within that system. And so there's this uh, sort of immutability to it because th these these blocks are linked together every time. A, yeah, I don't know how in how much technical detail I want to go here because then I think it could actually become more confusing than, than less confusing. But the, the the easiest way to think about it is that it's basically a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network that is essentially more or less a, a database of transactions. And then there's different implementations of blockchain. So, I mean, Bitcoin, for example, is uh, the Bitcoin blockchain is, is fairly simple in its design. It's just this sort of decentralized ledger of transactions. And it basically allows people around the world to exchange in this cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin. But then you have things like Ethereum, which brings some level of programmability into a blockchain. So instead of just being, let's say a decentralized database, it would be like having a decentralized database where all of the cells within that database can actually run a computer program. Um, and this increases the complexity of what that blockchain can do quite a lot. And in the case of Ethereum, those computer programs are smart contracts, which can be programmed to do a lot of different things. Cryptocurrencies are just the sort of, let's say the transactional currency in essence that these blockchains use to verify transactions and to allow people to use the network. Um, what's really interesting for me and where these systems become quite interesting are not necessarily around the transfer of value or around, let's say, exchanging in a cryptocurrency between two parties, it's actually around different designs for cryptocurrencies that are not necessarily financially driven or, or transaction based in that sense. It's when you get into what is called tokenization. So there's sort of your very common cryptocurrencies. And I think the things that most people would be familiar with like Bitcoin and Ethereum, but then you also have all of these projects, many of which are building on the Ethereum blockchain that create tokens that have a certain utility. And those tokens can allow you to do things, for example, like vote or participate in governance um, around a structure or an organization. And this is pretty intrinsic to what VitaDAO is and how it works. So VitaDAO in essence is a, is a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization. And the easiest way to think about this would be, it's basically a membership collective. It's a organization of people that come together, in this case, around funding longevity research. But the DAO is, is nothing more than the organization of people from around the world who have some common goal. And instead of having a sort of top-down management structure, like a company would have, for example, it is governed through technology, in, in this case, a smart contract, where any member who possesses some number of these tokens can make a proposal and can vote on proposals that are made. And those, those proposals, when they're approved, become the bylaws or essentially the, the rules of that organization. Um, this is particularly interesting because it, in this case, it, it means that you don't have a structure where one person or a centralized entity is able to control the organization or able to exert a lot of pressure on it. Instead, you have a community of people who are coming to consensus around something. And the way that that is ensured and mediated is really through a technology, a smart contract, as opposed to, let's say, uh, an executive board or something like that. Well, I think that's pretty helpful. I'm not sure if that was... Uh, <laughs> I, I still feel like there's like too much complexity. Like and I, I wish I could. Yeah, I'm always, I think this is a huge struggle. Like I'm always thinking of what is the simplest way to explain these things to, to anyone so that they would immediately get it. And I think because uh, I'm often quite in my head about this stuff, right? Like we were thinking about these technologies quite a lot. I would say the easiest way to think about it would almost be like a DAO is like a, a you know, a, a membership community that you can join and everybody basically has voting rights and those voting rights determine how the organization functions.
Okay, no, that really has helped. And um, on from that point, I do agree that there does seem to be quite a large learning curve to understanding these different terms behind uh, blockchain technologies. And I was just wondering, because as we'll go on to, um, what Fita was effectively trying to do is uh, fundraise um, academic research. And so um, for those academics who maybe don't have uh, so much of an understanding about blockchain, do you, th- do you think that's going to be a bit of a a barrier to recruiting more people into the ecosystem and how do you foresee trying to mitigate that? Definitely. So, I, I mean, you know, we've thought a lot about this and, and, you know, in the beginning there was, I think a lot of conversation, like, you know, I, I don't inherently view VitaDAO as a, as a crypto based organization. And I think this is a problem that a lot of blockchain projects have. It's like the blockchain part of front and center and often the, what they're actually doing or the mission and the vision gets lost in the complexity of the blockchain stuff. In VitaDAO's case, the blockchain is simply a tool in a tool set that enables a certain uh, a certain outcome, which in this case is bringing together a decentralized community of people around a common goal. I, I would say before the pandemic, one thing that's really interesting is that I would say your average person knew a lot less about blockchain because of things like the sort of NFT craze and how yeah, how front and center the markets have been, I've been really surprised by, let's say, the, the level of understanding that your average academic even has around blockchain technologies. More universities are, are looking at these technologies quite seriously. Pharmaceutical companies, you know, the vaccine rollout, for example, was using some level of blockchain in the sort of supply chain optimization. So these things are going from being what I think were fringier concepts five years ago to being quite mainstream. That said, it still is is an onboarding hurdle. And I think the blockchain space also also suffers from from a legitimacy problem. There's a there's a huge, it's an unregulated space. It's like the early days of the internet in some cases. And so you see every variety of project use case, scam, et cetera, unfolding. And I think a lot of people tend to, the things you hear about maybe are these speculative bubbles, or you hear about, you know, crazy volatility in markets. And these things create a certain stigma and they create a certain barrier um, to onboard people. But this is something we're always trying to work on. How do we simplify our language? How do we simplify the value proposition? And I think what will happen is that DAOs themselves will go from being this crypto thing to essentially the sort of terminology, like if I said to you, a nonprofit foundation, a company, or a DAO, people will understand what those three things are, and they won't be thinking so much about the blockchain components that that enable DAOs to operate. Um, but yeah, it's a really good point. It's it's a it's difficult in many cases to be able to quickly give the one minute elevator pitch on like what this is and why it's valuable um, for sure. Well, no, thank you for that. And so obviously leading on from that, um, you are trying to um, raise uh, money to be able to fundraise early research in the longevity space. And so how does that fundraising actually work? And given, as you kind of mentioned, how the value of these different uh, cryptocurrencies, in this case, it's the FITA tokens, they may fluctuate in value. Does that like affect how much um, like money you have to give to different uh, researchers? So the way the initial fundraise work, there's many different ways to fundraise in, in, in crypto. Um, and the way that you fundraise typically has some effect on the type of community that, that ends up forming around the, the project that you're trying to create. And so the way that we wanted to do it was what is called a, a fair launch. It's a, it's a common term in the crypto space, but probably not known to anyone who's, who's not somewhat deep in it. And what, what it means is basically you have, so VitaDAO basically created uh, some number of tokens. In our case, it's um, 64 million tokens, which is actually the, the lifespan in minutes of Jean Calment, who's like the, the longest lived woman on, on earth. So you create some, the longest lived person on earth. And so you create some number of tokens, in this case, 64 million. 10% of those tokens were sold in an auction to basically anyone who wanted to be a member of VitaDAO. And the team that built VitaDAO didn't determine the price or how much we were raising. Actually, the initial community, by creating bids and basically specifying how many tokens they want to purchase, created the, the market cap and the sort of the amount that we would fundraise. We had a, we had a certain target, which was actually quite low initially. It was, was less than a million dollars. And as long as that goal was exceeded, 
the, the entity would form, uh, sort of like a Kickstarter, where if you don't reach that target, everyone's money is returned. In doing that, this 10% of tokens that were sold were, were auctioned to about, I think it was like 635 participants, something like that. And now that community that fundraised and, and purchased these, these governance tokens basically also controls the entire DAO. They have access to the remainder of the 90% of tokens. And even the team that created Vita DAO, for example, needed to make a proposal for that community that now governs the DAO to give us tokens, for example, to be able to participate in governance. So it was really, it was truly an example of decentralizing a community early on to, you know, away from a team and to a, to a group of stakeholders. We raised through that auction what at the time was a, a, about $5.1 million. And then some portion of the treasury was kept in Ether, which has a certain amount of volatility. Um, and now that is worth about, I, I believe, $8 million. And what wow. MetaDAO is doing is slowly selling that um, Ethereum into stable coins. So into USDC, which have no volatility whatsoever. So the, the money that VitaDAO has raised will be converted into a stable coin that will not fluctuate. And so that treasury exists there to continue funding research. Now, the other component to this is that now the DAO is still sitting on, um, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly how much it is. Let's say it's like 45 million VITA tokens or something like that at this point. Those VITA tokens can be given to researchers, anyone that wants to join the DAO in exchange for their work. So we use this as an incentive to motivate people to join the organization, to contribute to evaluating projects, sourcing projects, educating the community. And they could also be sold in subsequent financing rounds to enable the DAO to raise more money. But at the end of the day, their function is actually as a governance token. This isn't a cryptocurrency in the sense that it's not something that is meant to be you know, used as a store of value or a transaction of, 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 of money. It's something that allows anyone who's interested in Vita DAO around the core mission to actually engage in in governance decisions and to participate and to vote and to have a voice in the community. Um, so the, the instability issue that is intrinsic to a lot of cryptocurrencies is not a problem for us from a fundraising perspective um, because our treasury is kept in, is, is, is you know, being moved into stable coins. And while Vita, the token does have a value on secondary markets, the goal isn't to, you, you know, some, even if that price is quite stable over time, or even if it drops, or even if it goes up, there's enough of those tokens that exist to be able to do subsequent rounds of fundraising. But the economic mechanism through which VitaDAO ultimately wants to become sustainable is actually through its investments into projects and the resulting intellectual property. So in some way, you can see the initial auction as like a bootstrapping mechanism that allows us to raise some money to really begin funding projects. And then over time, those projects should actually mature to a point of being somewhat commercializable or you know, it, it be able to generate you know, some amount of revenue for, for the DAO to continue funding longevity research and creating this sort of circular economy. Cool, no, that was a really good explanation. And so I guess to help um, explain for the DAO a bit further, um, it'd be good to kind of walk through the example that's already started, which is the first fundraising of the project from the University of Copenhagen. And so um, would you be able to um, elaborate a bit more on how, what happens during that transfer of funds and how you then acquire intellectual property rights, but then how that is kept updated and then eventually, I guess, down the line, used and commercialized upon. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's fairly, there's a little bit of complexity to it, but there's also, I think, a lot of bridging in of real world processes that would happen exactly if a pharmaceutical company, for example, was, was doing a sponsored research agreement with the university. So basically what happens is VitaDAO we, with, the, with the example of Copenhagen, this project was identified. They had an interest in raising uh, uh, $250,000. They scoped out a series of experiments, which in, in this case is initially testing these therapeutics that I described earlier in um, Drosophila melangaster, so in, in fruit flies, and then later in, in human cells, looking at a variety of, of for example, um, DNA repair proteins, P53, a number of things that might have some, that these drugs might have some implication on from a, from a biochemical perspective. They scope out these experiments and basically VitaDAO creates what's called a, a sponsored research agreement where 
we, sp we basically say we will fund this course of experiments in exchange for ownership of the intellectual property that results from those experiments. Now, some of the complexity here is that academics don't often know, especially in the early stages, what the, you know, let's say the path to IP looks like for their project. They don't necessarily know what the commercial use case is for their project. So we have a group of people within the VitaDAO community in the context of what we call working groups. This is almost like a department within VitaDAO that contains um, subject matter experts. This can be people who have a background in biotech and VC and pharma, academics, PhDs, postdocs. The community is open to anyone who basically has a skill and wants to, to yeah, help patient. And they help determine with legal counsel. So we also have a legal working group that consists of IP lawyers, people who have worked in licensing. They help create with the academic and often with the tech transfer office in, in some cases, if necessary, um, what the sort of IP agreement will look like. This is basically then agreed to, uh, but then you have another problem, which is that a DAO is a jurisdictionless entity that exists on the Ethereum blockchain. It's not a company, it doesn't have an address. And so this is now quite a foreign uh, engagement for a university. It, it's something that is quite novel. So how do you how do you overcome this? And so what is actually done? There's there's two things that are done. The DAO can elect in in let's say a very simple implementation. The DAO can elect agents or representatives or create SPVs, special purpose vehicles, to engage in these sort of legal agreements in a rather vanilla way with the university. But what Molecule has been building and and what I think is quite interesting is, is basically taking these, these, um, these contracts or research agreements and actually attaching them to what we call an IP NFT. Um, people might have heard of NFTs from the, from the art space and the music space. You know, you see people are spending in some cases absurd amounts of money for, for like what looks to be a JPEG, <laughs> but, but NFTs are actually a really powerful technology. Um, there, it's basically a non-fungible token, which means that unlike a Bitcoin, which is, you know, infinitely divisible to an extent, maybe not infinitely, but divisible quite a lot, um, a non-fungible token is something that can't be divided. And therefore, it's really suitable for representing a real world asset. You could make a non-fungible token of a deed to a house, for example. Um, and this actually allows the DAO to hold that intellectual property in a smart contract implementation. So basically, the way it works is... The DAO and the university engage in, in a regular sort of um, legal agreement the way they would with any sort of company or organization. But in this case, that legal agreement is, is attached to an NFT and then held within the DAO. And now you have basically um, this, this NFT that can be transacted and sold. You can, you know, basically do, do anything with it in the, concept, in the context of the cryptocurrency space, but it can also be held by a DAO sold on in the future, um, yeah, but by an entity that either wanted to buy it on the blockchain or could, for example, that same legal agreement could move off chain and be out licensed by, let's say a biotech company, for example. Okay, so there are options to take it off once it joins effectively. Yeah, and so that's at the, that's really at the, at the decision of whoever's owning or stewarding the, the NFT. So in, in this case, Avita Dal said that, hey, we're interested in selling this, this NFT, which again is just a proxy for the intellectual property that, that the project is producing. They could do that in a transaction where they, they moved it off chain, but it could also, for example, be, be bought by, let's say, another DAO or a group of individuals that said, hey, we're interested in funding this, or yeah, we want to, to you know, purchase this for X or Y reason. And I think, although it's quite early, what you're going to see happening over the next, let's say, five years is the creation of many different DAOs and many different therapeutic areas with different use cases and design implementations. And you're going to start to get this sort of, you know, Web3 driven drug development system where it will be very easy to transfer IP, to transact in IP. Um, yeah, there'll be Molecule, for example, is building a marketplace for IP NFTs. And this is the sort of thing that we want to enable very quickly. For example, a community to come together. Let's say you brought together, I don't know, um, a group of people around Huntington, Huntington's disease, for example. And we want to be able to allow researchers to very quickly 
mint NFTs of the research projects, specify the sort of licensing terms, and then rapidly enable these communities that are being built with their own incentive mechanisms, their own funding frameworks, to very quickly fund those research projects and have exposure to the intellectual property. Um, again, very early, but this is the sort of long-term thinking around this. Cool, no, it all sounds really exciting. And so in terms of the actual projects, what kind of longevity projects are you looking for? So the communities, I mean, I, I would say we're somewhat agnostic to like, if you wanted to think about aging in the context of like hallmarks, for example, I would say we're quite agnostic to, to the hallmarks that we're focusing on. But um, because of the because of the nature of VitaDAO and this idea that we're trying to create a vehicle that is self-sustaining and itself has some longevity, they should be projects that have some IP component or some potential to commercialize. That commercialization doesn't need to be driven by, let's say, profitability. It just needs to be the sort of thing where there, there ultimately has to be some way for the DAO to sustain itself. So they tend to be, the projects tend to be projects that are drug development pro focused or biomarker focused or diagnostic focused. We wouldn't, we likely wouldn't fund very early stage basic research looking at something fundamental that wasn't ultimately trying to create something that let's say would have a strong impact on patients or con consumers very directly. Um, the, you know, there's a community of, of people that make up the working groups and everybody has their own, you know, they're mostly academics, they have their own biases and their own sort of, you know, where they come from in the aging space. And ultimately, like, yeah, I suppose there, if you went and surveyed the whole community, you would probably find some sort of preferential breakdown of like what people are really interested in. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty broad. I mean, there's there's also because it's a decentralized collective. There's these other things that we could sort of do that I think are quite interesting, but are still somewhat early, like decentralized clinical trials, for example, or looking at, for example, if you have a community of thousands of people that are able to, you could do things with like, yeah, that are maybe not focused on commercialization, but are focused on like a decentralized trial for a behavioral intervention. And these are also things that I think might be really interesting for the community to, to fund and develop. Um, but yeah, very somewhat agnostic to the actual, um, let's say, hallmark uh, of, of aging that, that is to be focused on. Oh, no, thank you for that. And so as a researcher, like, what would, um, why would a researcher choose to be to doubt as opposed to going the more traditional routes of getting funds, especially maybe if they were like, less familiar with um, the technology? Yeah, I think the primary draw is the difference between having, you know, a community or not having a community. The, the, the greatest strength that VitaDAO gives to a researcher is having a couple of thousand people at this point. I think there's almost 2,000 people in the Discord that are really interested in your work and want to support you and who you have the opportunity to, as a researcher, actually engage um, in, in sort of, let's say, a, a more open science like conversation, you have the ability to check in with people, have community calls. All of a sudden, there's this network that's really interested in your work, and they're not necessarily driven by the same endpoints that a VC or a startup would be driven by. So I think if you're if you're an academic that is beginning to create something that is looking more like a product, more like a drug that needs to be brought to market, your funding sources change. It's no longer, let's say in the United States, NIH grants that are going to support you. You have this sort of translational gap, which I think colloquially, colloquially referred to as, as the valley of death in biopharma, where you basically go from you know, sort of drug discovery to something that needs to come to market. And this gap is, is called the Valley of Death because it's very hard to fund. It's where a lot of innovation goes to die. And the reason that it's hard to fund is that you now need to either as an academic create a startup or you need to find maybe, maybe a company to outlicense this technology or you need to, let's say, partner in a co-development deal. You don't really have the capacity to use grant funding sources to fund this. So I would say that a lot of academics, although yeah, maybe they're really interested in furthering this technology, don't, aren't in a position to, or don't want to go and leave their academic post and create a startup company. It's a completely different path. Um, and many of them are, let's say, still some number of experiments short from having a project or a piece of IP that would be optimal for an outlicensing event or even a co-development deal. And this is the gap that BetaDAO is trying to fill. And so what we offer is, you know, a, a, a source of, of funding where instead of having, you know, a VC, which still serve 
arguably a very important role in, in biotechnology um, are driven by, again, different endpoints. It's, it's, again, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a business in essence. Um, instead, you have a community of people who might have any number of, of, of interests in seeing this developed. The main thing that we're trying to optimize for in VitaDAO isn't necessarily the, 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 the profitability, but ensuring that these technologies come to market so that they actually end up having an impact on this community of people. People want to see, um, yeah, we want to move the needle on aging in a way that is somewhat applied and where in our lifetime, there's some ability to really implement the sort of technologies that, that, that are being funded. So I would say, yeah, I mean, to, to summarize it, it's really to have a community of people that you're working with and who, that are funding your work and interested in what you're doing as opposed to a, a VC. Thank you. Yeah, so as you say, the community is definitely, I think, what makes Fleetedale very unique in terms of the funding space. And I know that the community, having been on the Discord myself, is growing in size and there's always uh, different conversations going on. And as part of the community, there's also things that you do in Fleetedale beyond just the funding, which is like the journal clubs that you're doing. And so I was just wondering, um, do you have any like future plans for um, Fleetedale in general beyond just the funding? And on from that, like what kind of uh, long-term plans or short-term plans do you have um, for Fleetedale? Yeah, so I mean, so I'll touch on two things. So there's the, on the funding, there's actually a couple of additional experiments that are happening, which is we're partnering with Gitcoin to do a quadratic funding round for longevity. This will be purely philanthropic. Uh, they won't be geared around IP and will basically be, there'll be like a matching pool where um, yeah, some number of laboratories, I think we're shooting for like 30 to 40 laboratories, will be uh, receive funding for projects that are not IP focused. So this is sort of more, an experiment with a grant funding approach alongside another really cool project that people should check out called, called Gitcoin. And then on the other side of it, it, it's going back to these like sort of educational resources and also creating a, a like, a, yeah, finding strength in this decentralized community. So the journal clubs are one component. We're starting an interview series with, with academics and prominent opinion leaders from the from longevity space that I'm really excited about. We're also looking at, um, yeah, we have basically what is called like a SciComm working group, so science communications. I think we want to do more webinars, more general educational content for the community. Um, but th what's really interesting is that like, I mean, on any given day, someone can show up to the VitaDAO community with an idea and rally people behind them. And then all of a sudden VitaDAO starts doing this thing. So, I mean, the journal club happened because really uh, there was an MD, PhD student called Nicholas who joined the community and yeah, I thought it would be really cool to start doing a journal club. And this is what's this is what's really exciting about these organizations for me. It's it's not so much the, you know, it's it's all of the ideas and all of the things that, you know, someone might bring to the table that wouldn't that would be somewhat difficult to implement in a traditional company or in a traditional organization. Some thing to this call could join Vita tomorrow and say, come into the group and say, hey, I'm really interested. I want to help the longevity working group. I'm happy to help, you know, source projects or evaluate projects. But also I think it would be really cool if we did, you know, a really um, in-depth hundred part series covering all the genes that are involved in the aging process. And, you know, in two days time, they would probably have another group of 10 or 15 people behind them Helping, helping them to create these things. And that sort of agility and, and that ability to like iterate and do things very quickly is, is very different from how companies work. Like if you think about what VitaDAO is, VitaDAO's existed for like 13 weeks, maybe 12 weeks. Obviously the planning to create the organization happened you know, for some number of months before that. But in like a period of six months time, roughly you have, you know, some number of millions of dollars in a community of 2000 people that has spun up around something and is now executing on these things. It's yeah, that, that to me is what is exciting about the crypto space. It's this like rapid iterative experimentation and this ability to yeah, bring a community together around something that would be difficult or impossible to do in a traditional hierarchical sort of organization structure. Exactly. And it sounds like super exciting to see it grow so big. Um, but is that the possibility, though, that it could, you know, grow kind of out of control and um, that lose some ability to keep track of everything that's going on? Because obviously the idea behind the decentralization is that no one's like effectively in control. But do you need some elements of control to kind of like, you know, keep things on track? 
Definitely. And I mean, this is something, yeah, we've had DAOs come with like a huge number of challenges. It's not that easy to coordinate a huge group of people. And there are many things where it's like, you know, it wouldn't be valuable to have 600 people deciding on like where an article should be published, for example. Like there's many small things that, you know, you can see why management teams exist and you could see why bureaucratic structures exist. So I, I think it would be silly to think that like, all of these, there's, you don't need to reinvent the wheel here. There are a lot of reasons why having some structure makes sense. And so to address that, the structure within Vita DAO is always evolving. As, as I mentioned before, we have these things called, called working groups. And some amount of autonomy is vested into those working groups from the community. So for example, um, you know, it is expected that the longevity working group is providing due diligence on scientific research projects uh, to be able to guide the community on what makes sense to fund. They don't have the ability to override the community and execute, but they are constantly making recommendations on, on you know, what should be funded and why. Or if something looks like it's a, you know, maybe a bit scammy or not real science, they would advise the community not to vote on this. We also have an operations working group, which is basically tasked with trying to, to create structures to help all of the contributors that are working on Vita Dell be able to do a good job and have some continuity between these groups and avoid redundancy, for example. So these are sometimes very simple things like setting up a CRM system or having an air table where bounties and tasks are, are managed. And you know, some number of those things are implemented. And then you see that like, okay, this is not working well at all. It's super chaotic. Like, how are we going to, how do we improve? And then somebody comes in with a better idea and the community trusts that person to implement it. So it, it's this very iterative experimental process where over time there are some, let's say conventional structures that form and you do learn a bit from like the agile startup approach. But at the end of the day, the, the core decision-making and the, you know, executive function lies within the entire community. Um, but yeah, as you rightfully said, huge number of challenges. And, you know, I think in, you know, in some number of years, we're going to be able to look back and say that like decentralized organizations are very good at these things. They're not so good at these things. Um, and, you know, it's an experiment in a, in a new type of structure to, to do this sort of thing. Exactly. But I think that the understanding I'm getting is that these cell systems are kind of adaptable. And so the hope is that you'll be able to find solutions and alter the structure. And so um, one kind of like more cliche question is, um, what does your typical day look like being uh, the co uh, like initiator of Molecule and now developing FutaDAO? Yeah, so I mean, it's it, it's it's a lot of time spent in front of the computer, unfortunately. <laughs> like maybe more than I would I would I would like to, but it's yeah. So I mean, Molecule is a is a startup company of, of which I'm the the co-founder, and we're at a point where we're we're trying to scale quite rapidly. We're trying to create this marketplace for IPNFTs. A lot of the work is linked to VitaDAO um, because VitaDAO is really I would say the first real world use case for some of these technologies that we've been developing. Um, and then, yeah, Vita DAO was created by a, a community of people, right? I'm one of I'm one of the people who have, have contributed to, let's say, the creation of Vita DAO. But there, there's quite a few, and I think there's this forward feedback cycle happening where I think I was quickly identified early on as one of the people, and now being in a lot of interviews and stuff. But there's actually a ton of amazing people from that community that have played a, a really crucial role in bringing the organization to life, and and also that I think. Um, yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis or doing a lot of like, in many cases more so than me, a lot of the, the let's say, nitty-gritty work of, of making the organization function. The, the challenge for me from like a, what my day looks like at the moment is being a part of these Discord communities that are across time zones and, and never stop. So, I mean, it's, I'm trying to find ways to like make time for exercise and also turn off my phone at 11 o'clock at night, maybe. So I'm not getting notifications. These are like some of the challenges that I think that come with working with people in Singapore and California and the UK. Um, it's extremely globalized sort of thing where, you know, it's always somebody's core cool working hours, which is an interesting challenge. And I, I think when you start with these things, it's super exciting and you sort of always like, I don't know, I want to be able to react to any question that comes in at any time, but then it's also like, yeah, you can quickly get to a point where you're like very burnt out and yeah, need to feel like you need a digital detox. Um, but yeah, at the moment I wish, you know, it's not like being in a 
in a lab or anything anymore. I'm sitting at an office, you know, for, for Molecule or at home in front of my computer in the metaverse, in essence. <laughs> Cool. No, it definitely does sound exciting, though. Um, and so kind of side something a bit from Fleet of Bell, because also you have a much better knowledge of I don't know, like blockchain technology, blockchain technology than I do. I was just wondering, like, besides Fleet of Bell and using the technology to fundraise and create these um, IP NFTs that you mentioned, what other like applications of blockchain do you foresee in terms of being able to help with longevity, either in research or from like any more like personalized therapeutics? Yeah, so there's a number of, in the past six months, one of the, the probably the most exciting, I mean, I don't know if it, it's a cause and effect sort of thing, but I, I think one of the most exciting things that I've been seeing is, is other people who have ideas for DAOs reaching out to us and saying like, hey, we want to build X or Y. And so for years, DAOs were sort of like quite self-contained within the crypto space, meaning that it was like, you know, DAOs were used to develop projects on Ethereum or govern a, a protocol that a blockchain was using. You know, I had a call with someone the other day who wants to create, he's a, a geoengineer and he wants to create a DAO that's focused on terraforming and is, is basically geared at aligning the academic community. There's DAOs that are focused on now just open science and basically creating like these almost open source community-based research journals for the publication of like negative results. There's people who are creating DAOs, all of these, all of these organizations, like, you know, a DAO can have any structure, right? It doesn't need to be based around intellectual property. It doesn't need to be like, Vita DAO is a very specific design implementation of a DAO, but you could also create a DAO that said, hey, we're gonna bring together, I don't know, a hundred people, pool a certain amount of money and just donate it to, to research projects. Or we're going to create a DAO that's focused on doing, you know, you, you could run a decentralized trial for Metformin by a DAO. So I think there's, what we'll start to see over, over the next couple of years in the longevity space and beyond, I, I believe, is, you know, this sort of, um, this sort of rapid acceleration of, of these communities actually creating these experiments that hopefully have an impact on, on longevity space. And the crypto space, even beyond DAOs, is playing an important role. Like, uh, I'm not sure if you heard about, there's a project called Impetus Grants that was just created in the longevity space. Basically, it's like $21 million that is going to be given. It's like, you know, the model of fast grants, for example. It's like a and fast have you grants was basically... Yeah, so Fast Grants was a was a program that I think uh, basically said that hey, we're going to we have a certain amount of money, we're going to make decisions to fund grants or like it was mostly a, a group of philanthropists that got together and they were going if you have a project idea, we'll fund you within two weeks. And they did this in the context of COVID, and I think they developed you know they made quite a lot of progress in developing like new testing approaches and stuff like that. This impetus grants is a is a new approach to doing that for longevity. So it's twenty one million dollars in funding for for longevity research. There's no strings attached whatsoever. If you have a good idea and it's interesting and it's, it has to be early stage basic research, so something that's not commercial, commercially viable, like sort of high risk basic research, uh, you can apply within two weeks, they'll, they'll get you the money. And this is really interesting. But you know, the person who funded that was uh, the guy who created IPFS, which is the, the basically a, a storage network on, on blockchain. So there's a huge amount of, one of the other really interesting things is that there's a lot of people in crypto um, who have made a lot of money at this point. They've, they've, yeah, in some cases, like somewhat accidentally. And so all of this funding that exists, I think is going to begin to leave the crypto space to some extent and start to be focused on things like terraforming or space colonization or longevity, all these things that are quite like really capital intensive and it's not clear who's going to pay for them. And that to me is like really exciting. I think DAOs will play a big role in this because those people who are deploying their funding into these spaces are going to want to make sure that um, you know, it's decentralized communities that are basically governing how those funds are being spent. Yeah, it's good to hear. Because I mean, like, it seems like now each week there's always new, new news about um, more uh, funding for longevity research. Like there was even the news last yeah. weekend about Altos Labs, which sounds very exciting. Um, yeah, totally. I think it's definitely the best year for the space in terms of funding and like the interest pouring is, is, is incredible. So hopefully we get to the point of actually receive like, uh, yeah reaching escape velocity in our in our lifetimes <laughs> so talking yeah talking more about the longevity research itself are there any areas that you're most excited about in terms of uh, longevity research 
Yeah, I mean, so I have I have my own biases. I was always really interested. I mean, I studied DNA damage and repair, and I always thought this was really interesting because I, I really liked the idea of being able to prevent things like mutation or, for example, like if we were able to bolster our own endogenous DNA repair response, it feels like there was a tremendous amount of, of damage that we would be able to avoid and, you know, maybe even to a certain extent be able to avoid the, the aging phenotype. That said, I think it's, you know, the, that field actually hasn't produced an incredible amount of like, yeah, tangible pharmacological targets or something. Where I'm most interested from a practical perspective, perspective at the moment is, is really around like rejuvenation biotechnology and, and replacements. Um, one of the projects that I learned about recently that I was, yeah, I think most excited to hear about was a project from Jean Hebert at, at Albert Einstein University, which is focused on brain cell replacement. Um, he gave a talk to the Foresight Institute, if anyone's interested in, in learning more about this project. But I think the core idea is that, you know, most of your body, we, we already really have the technology to recapitulate the function of or replace many aspects, many organ systems or aspects of the body, right? So the heart is a pump, the lungs are a pump, kidneys you could sort of do with, with, with dialysis machines, for example. The liver is quite complex. Maybe that's a little bit more difficult, but ultimately the, the black box is the most difficult thing to really let's say uh, fix would is the brain, right? And so you have this, I think even if we were able to, even if we were able to treat the aging phenotype in every other aspect, if we can't do the brain, it all becomes meaningless. You could transplant a brain into a cybernetic body and that brain could still get Alzheimer's, for example. It's, it's, it's this really challenging thing. So, you know, there are now projects being started that are hyper ambitious that are looking at like brain cell replacement therapy, where you would slowly begin to, to let's say, replace small parts of the regions of the brain and allow the sort of yeah, the neuroplasticity and these basically to form and, uh, you know, establish old connections. And over time, you would be able to like, you know, I, I forget what the, what the paradox is, but it's the one about replacing, um, planks on a ship like if if you eventually if you rebuild a ship by replacing all of these wooden planks is it still the same ship at the end of the day and this is sort of the idea like the slow replacement of brain cells and i really like this and i'm, I'm generally interested in I, I think rejuvenation biotechnology is something that's accelerating quite a lot and something that might be accessible in our in our lifetime Okay, I think, yeah, there's so many different areas now. Um, it's like, it's hard to keep up with all of it, I have to say. Um, but yeah, there's definitely yeah. many different exciting um, avenues. And so um, just to kind of more wrap things up a little bit, um, do you have any more general advice about anyone wanting to learn more about either blockchain technology or advice about someone um, wanting to maybe start their own DAO or start their own initiative that would help to, um, or for any kind of reason? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think the cool thing about DAOs is they're, yeah, it's, it's actually relatively easy to start one and the, the tooling is really advancing to a point like there are some organizations that are working on like basically software that allows you to launch your own DAO like with a couple clicks of a button. These are still quite early, but I think in the next six months it will, these technologies will begin to mature quite a bit. I would say, I mean, the space is wide open and it's also very playful. It doesn't have to be, you can create, you know, a very silly implementation of a DAO just to mess around, or you can get together with 10 or 20 friends and launch your own token. Like the blockchain space is like a giant sandbox where anybody could basically go and begin to experiment with an incentive system or an idea. And I think that's why it's attracted, you know, a lot of people and why it's also beginning to resonate more and more with scientists. It's this active area of experimentation. So I would, I would suggest anyone who's interested, check out DAO stack, check out the token engineering commons. There's a number of discord communities that are open. They're really great people in them. And if you have an idea and you're interested in building something, you can connect with other people and, and find out how to do this or, or find out how to, yeah, how to help. Maybe you could learn, you know, I think if you, one of the best skills you could possibly learn right now is like learning how to code solidity and write smart contracts, which are going to become increasingly important over the next years. And then in terms of, yeah, in terms of like, um, the longevity community, I think one of the things that's interesting is that, I mean, it, it is this really broad and inclusive community. If you join like the longevity subreddit, for example, there's like a hundred thousand people that are always talking about this stuff. It, there's a, I mean, family isn't the right word to use, but it really feels like this collectivist sort of like uh, very 
inclusive and welcoming communities. And, and the blockchain space is the same. It's like, yeah, if you want to build something and you have an idea and people resonate with that idea, you could very quickly get uh, something going. So yeah, I would strongly encourage anyone to check that out. And more importantly, how can anyone join Feta DAO? Uh, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, so the easiest way is to just join our Discord community. It's it's listed on the website. Um, it's relatively, yeah, you can join it within a couple, couple clicks of a button. Um, if you actually want to get involved in the working groups, they're, everything is fully transparent. So if you're in the Discord community, you can see longevity working group or operations working group. Feel free to reach out to any of the members in that working group or the steward, which will be visible as well, just to get involved. Um, particularly if you're a researcher or if you're an academic, um, there's a couple of ways that you can get involved. One is by helping directly with these working groups that I'm talking about, but we're also, you know, we're really looking for interesting projects to fund. Um, yeah, and I would say the, yeah, just a general call to researchers. If people have projects that you think would be suitable, we're, we're um, funding up to $250,000 for, for longevity focused research projects. And if you have any interest in just being a part of the community, even just a fly on the wall that's keen to observe how this experiment is going, please feel free to, yeah, to join the Discord community. Cool. So thank you, Tyler, for coming on today. It's been great to hear more about Peter Dow and the success you've had so far in doing your first uh, set of fundraising. And so it's you've made it kind of look so easy, but it's evident um, from speaking to you that there's been a lot of hard work that goes on behind the scenes. So yeah, thank you um, for everything you've done so far with Fita Dow. And yeah, thanks again for coming on. It's been a really great conversation. Yeah, and thank you for, for having me and for the amazing show that you've, you've created. This is, yeah, the, in terms of like scientific content that exists and taking complex things and, and simplifying, I think this is maybe the, the, the best channel that I've seen on, on YouTube. So it was really a pleasure to, to be on the show. I really admire the, the work that you're doing. Thank you. So I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.